It's a mystery still looming over the Hampton Roads community. Now, prosecutors are disappointed with today's hey, results. Everyone. Welcome to my channel. My name is Amanda, and today we are going to be talking about true crime in the news. If you haven't noticed, on my channel, my podcast, we talk about all things true crime related. In today's episode, we're going to go over a few cases that are currently in the news or have been that I believe we should talk about. Let's get into it. Real fast, I don't want to forget to tell you to subscribe to the channel and like the video. In the first case, we're going to talk about Jason Billingsley. I attempted to start covering him in a prior episode, but kids, they had to get off the bus. Today, they're home from school, so I'm recording this super early. It's Indigenous People Day, so let's hope that I can do it before one of them wakes up. Jason Billingsley is a little bit of a harder one, I feel like, to discuss because he has a few different incidences that we can talk about first. But I'm going to start with the later incident, which I heard his name first. This is when it was reported on, I feel like, after 26-year-old Pava LaPierre was found murdered on her rooftop building of her apartment on September 25th, 2023. An autopsy would reveal that she was beaten, strangled, and raped. Now, all this is happening in Baltimore, Maryland. So if I refer to police, I'm talking about the Baltimore Police Department, unless I otherwise say. Now, a welfare check was called on Pava to her apartment after she didn't report to work on that Monday, September 25th. It was really out of the ordinary for her. She owned her own company and was actually named on Forbes 30 under 30 list. Police reviewed surveillance footage of Pava's apartment building where they were able to identify Jason Billingsley as the man on video that was seen waving to Pava who was sitting, Pava was sitting in the lobby of her, my pup the lobby of her apartment building and man was seen waving over at the door as in to let him in like maybe he forgot his keys or maybe he was seeing someone there that he wanted to get in however it shows her walking over to the door opening the door Mel and Pava were seen talking and then both of them were seen going to the elevator Jason Billingsley allegedly because he is innocent until proven guilty allegedly Jason Billingsley was seen entering the lobby less than an hour later looking for an exit to leave the apartment building now this black male allegedly Jason Billingsley I'm going to say allegedly because until he goes to trial or pleads guilty allegedly he did confess after he was arrested now we know confessions aren't always soundproof however the evidence and the confession in this good to go I think but all of this happened on September 22nd according to police they saw her get home at a like 11 30 p.m and then this happened shortly after so I guess the late hours of Friday September 22nd and the early morning hours of Saturday September 23rd but she wasn't unfortunately found until she missed work on Monday September 25th coffee time it's early very early well not very early but early to be recording a video I normally like to record my videos when the sun is shining but it is not even 7 a.m here so let's get back to it so once Papa was found murdered on a rooftop apartment building the Baltimore police decided to have a press conference where they would release the name of Jason Billingsley but Jason Billingsley was already known to police because not only did he have an extensive criminal history, but he also was recently wanted for another rape and arson that took place just a few days earlier on September 19th. Police were called to a fire on September 19th around 9.30 a.m. where a female and male victim were pulled from a basement apartment. The female's throat was cut and her hands were duct taped together while the male's hands were handcuffed and his ankles were duct taped together. The female victim would say that it all started when she heard a loud banging on her front door by what she heard was a male and he would identify himself as a maintenance man who would be Jason Billingsley. Now this maintenance man would kick in the front door he would use duct tape, as I said, to bind the female's wrists, and he would handcuff the male. Jason would sexually assault the female victim before he would cut her throat and set them both on fire. The female victim would be able to get up and call for help after Jason departed the apartment. By calling for help, I mean yelling for help, not physically calling. She would be yelling for her neighbors to come help her from a basement grate that woke up her neighbor. Now, both victims were severely burned and would be taken to the hospital where they thankfully would survive. That's why we're calling them male victim and female victim. I know the male victim did release a statement or do an interview with the Daily Mail about what took place that morning. 
his burns. There were some photographs of his burns, and it looks like his whole life obviously has changed, not just mentally, but unfortunately he will be dealing with that for a long time. They talked about all the other horrors that happened that morning, including not a huge horror, but Jason stole his phone and police said that they would use this to track him. And you'll see in some um, press conferences and articles that the police were talking about tracking him. And I always wondered how they would. However, the police received a lot of backlash, as I said earlier, after not telling the public after of the arson and sexual assault that took place on September 19th, sparking the conversation that if police did release this in a press conference, the possibly Pava may not have let Jason into her apartment and this may not have happened. But police say that they had reason to believe that the arson and the assault were a targeted attack as in Jason knew this couple and the police did not think that for any reason that any danger was to the public. However, at the same time, like someone set two people on fire. <laughs> I mean, he, unfortunately, sexual assault happens way more than it should but he set two people on fire and cut her throat if that doesn't i just it just blows my mind if we know who did it i just i can't baltimore police i can't but thankfully jason was arrested on september 27th at a train station in bowie maryland where he would be charged with first degree murder and numerous other charges from pava's death and assault to the assault and attempted murder i would say on the female and male victim He's currently being held without bond, as he should be. And now, the biggest reason he is, I guess, brought up is because this dude should not have been out at all. As I said, he's had a lengthy criminal history that just blows my mind. So, Jason's past convictions include first-degree assault, second-degree assault, and theft. Before, he was convicted of a rape in 2013. In that rape conviction, he received a prison sentence of 30 years. However, 16 of those years are suspended more than half so he only really in my opinion in my mind would say he had a 14 year prison sentence and he was released on parole in october of 2022 so 2013 when it happened i'm assuming he wasn't sentenced right away but so that's like eight to nine years in prison that's such a shame so basically they said that he got out on good behavior he earned credits and i think that that's absurd that you can earn credits after good good credits after raping somebody i understand that sometimes people make mistakes i understand maybe on non-violent crimes maybe theft not that i think that's not violent it can be very violent but i just good credit after someone raped someone their charges from 2013 were not his first charges though at 18 years old he was given a two-year sentence of probation and then in 2009 he was sentenced to five years now in this case with five years he had a suspended sentence of four and a half years i can't believe that he got a second suspended sentence i'm gonna keep going now because it gets worse in 2010 he was sentenced to two years in prison for second degree assault and this confuses me because in my in my mind the suspended sentence means that if you mess up you serve out that entire time so he had the 2009 suspended sentence of four and a half years when he was arrested again in 2010 why wasn't he just sent back for those four and a half years and then he would be charged again in whatever happened in 2010 and receive another sentence. Why is that hard? I get we want to rehabilitate and I understand people make mistakes. I've made some bad mistakes in my life and there's things I wish that we that I could take back after hurting other people and doing things. But I'm that was nowhere near any of this, obviously. But I think that at some point enough is enough when it comes to these type of things. Like I don't care. I mean, I do care if someone's selling drugs because drugs kill people, but that just has is not the same to me as sexual assault or obviously murder, but still. So we'll see how this plays out. I'm assuming he is going to confess because the police said he already confessed once he arrested them. But again, we'll have to see. He better go to jail for the rest of his life because if he doesn't, there should be some real problems. Normally, I wouldn't follow with two back-to-back -back recaps like this, especially if it's not something too crazy. But we did find out some good information when Brooke Howe was back in court. So he was back in court for his arraignment or just in court. He wasn't back. I'm sorry. He was just in court for his arraignment via Zoom. He was on video on Thursday, October 5th, where we learned a few things that the prosecution shared with us. And I seem excited, but that's just because I'm excited that this is moving forward, that maybe we'll finally have answers for 
Crystal and Tommy's family. So the first thing that was talked about was a pretrial was set tentatively for February 8th, 2024, just to see where discovery is. Now, the prosecutor said that they should be ready to try this case in summer of 2024. However, the defense said that there's no way that they can give Brooks a fair trial if it's in 2024. So we'll have to see. But again, February 8th is the next time they're expected to be in court. If something arises, they may be in sooner. Now, also, of course, the defense asked for a lower bond. As I said in my last update, his bond is currently set at $10 million. And the defense argued that this was absurdly high and requested a more reasonable bond of $500,000. The defense said that even though he has like $8 million in properties that's held up on properties, he would have to go get a loan and all this other stuff. I don't know. You're in jail for murder. I think that you should be stuck in jail. But we'll have to see. The judge said that he would issue a written order regarding this bond. Let me check real fast that that came out because I've recorded this once already. It came out terrible. Not terrible, but the lighting was not good. It all depends where I am, who's around, who's home when I record and where the lighting is. It's, it sucks. I would assume nothing has been released though because it's been a weekend. It doesn't look like an issue has been, an order has been issued yet. Editing Amanda here. There has been an update. It appears that the judge has denied the request for reduce of bond and then his attorney has filed an appeal. I will update this as it comes. Now, during this hearing, like I said, we learned a few things. We learned that Brooks' supportive family, his sister, his mother, his brother-in-law, his mother's boyfriend, they all allegedly brought in recorders and recorded the grand jury, which I'm pretty sure that's illegal. So we'll have to see if any charges come out of that or anyone else gets arrested. However, why do you need to record the grand jury if you if everything's true and you don't have to get a story straight and you're not overly worried about getting arrested because you are arrested now? There's a reason you're arrested. So we'll see what happens with the family and that accusation. And the second thing that the prosecution shared, and I was not thrilled to hear this, but thrilled as you can movement in a cold, a cold case, basically. So the second thing that the prosecution shared was that authorities bought a gun from Nick Houck, who sold this gun under a fake name. And that gun is currently being tested because police believe that that gun was used in the murder of Tommy Ballard. Now, if you haven't been following this case, and I just said a whole bunch of stuff you don't understand, let me go ahead and explain real fast. So, Brooke's girlfriend, Crystal Rogers, has not been seen since July 2015 when she just vanished out of nowhere, and the last person to see her was her boyfriend, Brooks Hawk. So, naturally, Brooke was announced as a prime suspect in October of 2015, but it wasn't until recent when he was arrested at the end of September. Now, Nick Houck is Brooke's brother who was once a police officer for Bardstown, Kentucky, which is the town that Crystal and Brooks lived in. Nick would actually end up being fired from the police for interference with this investigation, and he failed a polygraph test regarding Crystal's disappearance. So, Nick, using a fake name, sold a rifle to someone, or the prosecution didn't really elaborate. Did Nick sell it to police under a fake name in like another undercover operation? Did Nick try to sell it to a wholesale retailer under a fake name and they were told by the police? Or did the police just looking through records find out putting things together that it was Nick who actually sold this gun under a different name? I'm sure more will come out as the case goes on. But why would you sell a gun under a fake name? Because that is a pretty big crime if caught. Guns aren't something to mess with, obviously. Obvious statement of this episode. But I wonder if that's because he has something to hide. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Prosecutors believe that the rifle will be linked to the murder of Tommy Ballard. As I said, who is Crystal Rogers' father? Tommy was murdered about 16 months after Crystal's disappearance. And many people believe, including Sherry Ballard, who is Tommy's wife and Crystal's mother, that once we get answers about Crystal's disappearance, then those answers will also help with Tommy's murder. So again, we'll have to see favorite thing to say this episode. The prosecutor said that there are five criteria that they look at when confirming or linking a gun and this gun that they have matched four out of five of those. So I'm very interested to see what comes out next and hopefully we hear something. Hopefully this isn't just something that goes into the abyss. We shall see. Now this last one I wasn't going to talk about because I may do an in-depth on it. I may not. I like to do some in-depth ones before the trial starts. And this is an upcoming trial. The State of Florida versus Jamal Demons. 
YNW Melly, or his legal name of Jamal Demons, who I'm going to just call Melly through this whole thing, is charged with a first degree murders of YNW Sack Chaser and YNW Juvie, who were reportedly very close to Melly. Now, Melly has already been through one trial, which ended in a mistrial after the jury deadlocked and couldn't come up with a verdict. The state of Florida fully intended or intends to retry Melly, which was to begin October 9th, which is today. But I, I never understood that because it's Indigenous People Day. So I don't know if it was really meant to start today, but this week. But due to recent accusations from the defense, the trial has been delayed. Now, Melly's lawyer have accused the state prosecutors of withholding information. And this is where the big thing is. This is why I decided to report on it and follow on it, follow it to see, because this is this is kind of crazy to me. And I'll go into details why. The defense asked to remove the Broward State Attorney's Office from the case and, and potentially dismiss the case entirely. So basically what happened at a hearing on Friday, October 6th, was a state attorney who works for the prosecution's office was called by the defense to basically be disposed. She told the court that she assisted in an investigation into Melly's mother, Jamie King, because she was accused of witness tampering. Now, the state attorney went on to say that during a meeting between the lead detective, Mark Moretti and Melly's mom, Jamie King, and her attorney. So the four, the state attorney, Moretti, who was the lead detective, Jamie King, who was Melly's, Melly's mom, and then Melly's mom's attorney were all in a small interview room. So the state attorney, whose name is Michelle Brutos, said under oath on the stand that during this meeting, Moretti executed a search warrant and wanted to seize Miss King's cell phone to review it for evidence of witness tampering. Now, from what the district or from what the attorney said on the stand, he was not in the right jurisdiction to serve this search warrant, which I think will take place of what we learn in a little bit. Jamie King was not pleased with this and attempted to do something with her phone. And at that, that point, Moretti forcibly grabbed the phone out of her hand. Everybody got a little upset. Jamie and her attorney would end up leaving. And after they did that, he Broward County deputy would come into the room and Michelle heard Moretti ask this detective or this deputy to say that he was there when he executed the search warrant, which he wasn't. And the state attorney reported this to her boss because you're basically asking someone else to lie while you're obtaining evidence. And as she said on the stand, she said she would never work with this detective again. The main point was that Michelle heard the lead detective ask this other detective to lie for him, which I don't believe this other deputy, I keep messing it. I don't believe this other deputy did lie for him, but he was asked to. Michelle would go on to say that she really wanted to ensure something was done because as a prosecutor or a state attorney, she felt this was obviously not ethical. So she would continue to follow up with her chain of command or higher ups. I'm not really sure what it's called in their office to find out what happened because all this happened in October of 2022. And from what the defense says, they were just given this information weeks ago. And that's crazy to me because this is a lead detective on the case who is accused of possibly lying to get evidence. And they kept this from the defense. And you know what happened between October 2022 and when this was given to the defense? Melly went to trial. He had a first trial where he could have been found guilty and sentenced to death. And I'm not saying that this evidence would have definitely like exonerated Melly or would have changed any outcome. But the point is that if a police officer is willing to lie at one point, how do we know he's not willing to lie at another point? They're supposed to have integrity. And I understand that, you know, this is not all police officers, but this one makes me nervous. I am no expert in any legal matters or anything like that, but I have been following some cases. I do enjoy the legal side as I talk about them. I'm talking about this legal side right now. I do enjoy understanding it because as I said in the last video, or maybe when I recorded already and didn't put out that I think it's important that we understand the legal system because what if one day someone you love can be arrested for a crime that they didn't commit and you have no idea what's happening. But anyways, back to this story. It seems like that's definitely appealable. It seems like if he was given the death penalty after he was convicted and this evidence came or this information came out that was withheld from them that the lead prosecutor attempted to lie about something in revolving the case. It's not like, and I know police can lie when they're like telling you things, but I, I definitely don't think they can lie when they're talking about how they executed a search warrant. And that's my biggest thing. I don't know if Melly shot and killed his friends at close range, then, drop, then was dropped off by his co-defendant, Cortland Henry. 
And then Cortland would go on to the hospital and tell the police and everybody at the hospital that it was a drive-by shooting. I don't know if Melly did it, but the gunshot trajectory of the bullets found inside the victims, a bullet casing was found inside the car, and evidence shows that the bullets were shot through the car and staged after the two men have already passed. They can tell that by their hearts not beating. You're not going to lose blood if you get a gunshot wound after your heart stops beating because there's nothing pushing that blood out. The prosecution during Melly's first trial did present a motive of money, but it wasn't like an overwhelming. I think it was like one text message that showed there was like some issue with money. So I'm not really sure the outcome of this case, if he's guilty, if he's not. But the problem is if misconduct was done, then they may throw out Moretti's entire testimony and may not be able to testify in the next trial. And that can be damaging to the case if Melly did do it. Plus evidence of a police officer lying is terrible in the course of an investigation. It puts a lot of doubt in people's mind, and I can't imagine that the jury is going to feel too good about the evidence shown. But we'll have to see how this plays out the next few weeks and if his trial continues to go or if it's thrown out. I have a feeling it's not going to be thrown out, but we'll have to see. But that's all I have. So please make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel. If you are listening to podcast form, go ahead and follow so you can get notified when I release new episodes. And if you've made it this far, I truly thank all of you for supporting me. I truly appreciate you. And until the next video, stay safe out there. The world can be an ugly place.